So, Peter, uh, thanks for joining us today. And uh, as I said in the introduction, you're the president of two uh, important international groupings, associations that deal with science and policy. One is INSA, the other is the ISC. So I, I let it up to you, I leave it up to you to explain shortly what those two stand for. Well, the ISC, the International Science Council, uh, is the premier body that brings all the scientific organizations of the world together. It has the scientific academies and has the scientific unions, like the Astronomical Union, the Physiological Union, and has the social science associations within it. And so it represents uh, most of the major scientific organizations in the world. It's based in Paris. Uh, it, um, de it does a number of scientific programs or sponsors a number of programs, initiates them. It is also the representative of the science community as chair of the science of the major group on science and engineering at the United Nations. It works very closely with a number of UN agencies. The International Network of Government Science Advice, or INSA, is a branch of ISC, which is focused and is a network of about 5,000 people in 100 countries that are, have experience as either scientists working on the policy interaction or policy makers working on the science policy interface. It also has within it a science diplomacy division, which actually focuses very specifically on science, how science and diplomacy interact. And, between, and that organization is probably the most active organization currently studying this interface, the, the experiences between science and the policy process during COVID. We need a kind of an in, uh, global scientific authority that only from the point of view of science uh, can come up with, 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 with judgment, with warnings, uh, because we have seen that scientists do work globally together. If you see how they work on the vaccines, on, on the fly almost, the consortia are made. But we don't have the proactive science <clears throat> or the warning signs uh, doing the same uh, globally. And, and uh, the problem is, Peter, I think, and, and you know that certainly uh, one of the best uh, in, in the world is that as soon as the science comes too close to the politics, you get what you say, all the contextual uh, specificities. And it was the same science uh, in Sweden and in Norway, but they took a completely different approach. Uh, and, and so we need this kind of, uh, how to say it, um, independent scientific authority under God knows what umbrella, because WHO is probably already a bit too political uh, from what it has evolved or we, it can be revamped. And there, I think, as, as a community, as scientists, we have a big responsibility to do it, because if we wait, or it gets recuperated, or, or it, 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 it falls flat. So maybe this is one of our tasks to do well, this year. Funnily enough, Jean-Claude, we're engaged in some very early discussions through INSA and the Science Diplomacy Group in INSA on that very question. A year ago, uh, the International Science Council received a letter saying, should the International Science Council have a standing process to deal with a black swan event? Now, the black swan event may not be a pandemic. It could be an animal pandemic. It could be a massive Krakatoa scale eruption. There are many different kinds of black swan events that could occur where science and sciences, both the natural, social, and normative sciences are all needed. And we started on an early discussion about it, but didn't get very far for various reasons which were more that I think people couldn't see the urgency of that discussion, even though there were people that did. I think COVID's changed that, and literally in about a month's time, there's going to be an early first discussion on what, on what kind of possibilities could there be, without overstating it, because at the end of the day, Jean-Claude, whatever scientists think, it's politicians and policy makers that make the decisions that, and they are the ones who are responsible. 
what we can only do as scientists is provide the evidence. And in this case, it's not just providing the evidence, it's also describing the uncertainties that are surround the evidence. Because again, that's part of the, the challenge is how do you transmit the uncertainties, talk about what we don't know as much as what we do know, and, and therefore what are the probabilities and what are the appropriate responses to take at different stages in the pandemic. So we have seen some countries change their strategy. So for instance, if I take the United Kingdom, it moved from a herd immunity strategy to a flatten the curve strategy, perhaps later than it should have, but that's, that's for others to judge at this moment. But countries can change their strategy by reflecting on things in real time yeah. and doing so. Other countries have not done, done so. But, but I think that there is a need to find a way to be more linked up in a hurry. And that means being pre-prepared. There's been a lot of ad hocery here. And I think it would be better to have a mechanism that's more pre-prepared. But Absolutely. it's no use being pre-prepared just at the level of the science community. If the policy community's not prepared for that, for that, those inputs, it will not work. And no, so no, a lot to do at the level of UN, UN agencies. Um, let, let's say we got the global equivalent of, 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 of COVID for something that destroyed livestock. How would we handle that? WHO sits there well to handle a human pandemic, but there could be a pandemic of some kind that's very different. So I think there's a lot to learn yet, and, but I think we need the policy community to be on board. We actually, and that's gonna be difficult because of the, because of the difficult, poli different political positions that different countries have taken over the last few months. Yeah, you know what we actually, I, I think absolutely, Peter, and, and, uh, and, and I mean, science without the politics buying in is, is useless uh, to, 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 do, to do anything in this account. And what we actually need is a little bit, you know, like the World Economic Forum, which, which became a kind of a, a moral consciousness, a global consciousness for what goes wrong with capitalism and what has to be improved. We would need something similar, like a, a World Science Forum, uh, where you precisely, you have the science, but you bring in the politics. Where, where, where the discussion can be can be hold, where you can build the bridges, because otherwise, it, it, you know, I've seen this at the commission, you get hundreds of nice reports, but if no one reads them or wants to listen to them, it, it is quite useless. Huh? Well, well, that's where I'm hoping that INSA and ISC, and of course, our related organizations could take a role. And I think that, um, that I think that what INSA has been largely doing, as you know, up to now is building the capacity of scientists to talk to policymakers, but we've also started talk, think, looking about how to build the capacity of policymakers to talk to scientists, equally important in this situation. You, you never know the future, of course, but the, the big differences with, with, with past crises, which we have managed uh, or not, is that for the first time, this, is, this has affected the world on such a scale we have never seen before. It's a little bit, you know, in, in, here in, in Flanders, in Belgium, we had a discussion. It's a little bit of the, the world war of my generation, but without yeah. casualties. Because of and, the scale. Then, because Ebola and, 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 and so on was, was terrible, but far away. Uh, and here, it's not far away. I'm sitting at home in lockdown. And that is probably the big difference with, with pre, uh, past uh, crises. I fully agree with you. And I think that is the uh, opportunity but it yeah. would need a different kind of global forum to talk these things through to what we have at the moment. And maybe that's what we should be advocating, that there, it needs to be a proper, just as we have a COP, uh, you know, we have a process around climate change, which is the other existential risk of our times. Absolutely. Maybe we need a, a, an equivalent process, not just about disaster risk reduction in natural disasters, which is where after the Sendai process, we have something which has not progressed as fast as we might have hoped. Or is there something here for actually saying, this is time for the scientists and the policymakers of the world 
to get together and agree on some principles and an action plan to move ahead. And that's not being grandiose. I think we actually need to, as you said, the reset is big enough to justify a kind of Bretton Woods approach here, where there's exactly. a real reflection on where we go. If we specifically go to pandemics, the biggest issue is how do we get early warning? How do we get early? After Chernobyl, there was a convention rapidly uh, drawn up, uh, a convention on the early notification or the rapid notification of a nuclear accident. And all the countries, Russia, America, all signed that within a year, that convention. So there's now a convention which allows in the event of a nuclear accident, it's immediately notified to the Atomic Energy Commission and, 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 um, and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Do we need something like that for pandemic warning? I mean, forgetting the politics of the contention of what happened in this case, do we need an early warning system? We suspect the evolution of a new zoonosis or an outbreak of, of a known severe zoonosis. And that we have a convention on early notification and allowing access to uh, materials, uh, you know, like the, the viral material for sequencing, et cetera, et cetera, or whatever. Now, whether that could be done by a revamped WHO or needs a new structure, as some countries have, have talked about, I actually believe we need a mechanism for early warning of these things, which has got no embarrassment, but a understanding that these viruses and bacteria can move very rapidly in a world where people travel all the time and cross boundaries. And Vaughan Tarikian and I last week published a paper in the issues of science and technology suggesting that such a convention is needed in this case. Now, the convention's one thing. Let's assume that countries are notified. We do need coordination and I think some mechanism, at least for global South countries, on where the source of advice come from. And the WHO does some of that, but as I said, I think we need to look and learn both Ebola and with this event, there have been, is it move, able to move fast enough? Does it get is it far enough removed from politics to actually get to some of the nub of the problems? Going towards the end of our talk, Peter, um, let me zoom in on something which, which is close to your heart as well. And, um, you know, when I was reading, the, the, it, it, it has been emerging in the press the last couple of days about vaccine nationalism, you know? Uh, those who are first will only serve their own people first and then and then, of course, it's completely counterintuitive because the only way we can be in, uh, have an effective vaccination is that it should first hit, first be served for those who need it, the risk uh, population, and it should be global. So I was thinking, because I know that, and then I read your piece on that, that, is this not something where where science diplomacy can play a big role? Because it it, it doesn't make any sense at all if we if we follow this kind of. Uh, nationalistic approaches to, to getting out the vaccines? Well, the analogy is climate change, isn't it? I mean, yeah. where nationalism is getting in the way of dealing with the, the primary issue of our times in general, climate change, because no country, well, not no country, few countries are willing to make those economic resets that need to be made to address climate change. And, and so that's, a more, even more extreme example than the obvious example of vaccine development. And we have in vaccine development about 150 different vaccine developments going on. Some of them are government funded, some of them are philanthropy funded, some of them are national funded, some of them are collaborative. But the various incentives in play are quite dis disparate. So a private sector may have one set of incentives of how it will want to market, versus a, a government that's funded it that might want a nationalistic view versus a philanthropy that might have a, a different view. Now, we saw in Ebola quite a good concatenation or collaboration between those three sectors coming together uh, between the private sector, philanthropy, and governments 
around Ebola. And to some extent, we've seen it with the vaccine development, but it's quickly been, I agree with you. I think nationalism, but also commercial interests have come to, to determine what will happen. Ultimately, I think most of the vaccine discussions, uh, decisions will be made by the commercial companies, how they want to sell it, not by, not by governments, because most of the scale up is gonna happen within governments, within companies. And so, again, it comes back to the issue. This is the kind of where the UN Security Council makes decisions in other areas. This is the kind of thing where there needs to be an agreement. This is a global ex existential crisis. There needs to be a sharing of information, a sharing of resources, and some global decisions made about how these things are used. Because you're quite right. Uh, we can't get global travel back to normal. We cannot manage this pandemic uh, uh, without making sure that the whole population is effectively managed, probably by a vaccine. There may be other approaches that are being talked about. There are some other technologies being talked about, which are different to vaccines. But we need a global approach. Now, that sounds very utopian, but I think there are ways to do it while allowing the companies quite properly to get a return on their investment at the same time. Yeah, so, and I found it quite quite significant. And, and correct me if I'm wrong in my perception, Peter. But if you if most of the interviews that I read with the developers from the companies for the drugs, so the private companies, they are actually all of them unisono. We will make sure that the whole world, at a very reasonable price, will 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 get the benefit out of it because more than a national leader, they know how global the world is, isn't it? I agree with you. I think the problem has been the nationalism of some politicians. Absolutely. And, and who are playing to their political uh, constituencies. I'm going to look after you first. And, and that is the danger here. And we all know the, the Will Davis, who is a famous sociologist from Britain, wrote a book called Nervous States. And he points out when people are scared, they favour authoritarian government. And authoritarianism and nationalism have a have a close relationship, and so that I think that what we are seeing is that this, in a way, COVID has allowed some political processes to exploit the situation, Absolutely. And, and 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 this vaccine nationalism is part of that. Indeed, and then there I, there I think the scientific community has an enormous responsibility to keep hammering on there is only one way out, and that is the global one, isn't it? Exactly. And it's ironic, isn't it, that, that at a time when traditionally we have had suspicion <coughs> of private sector science, it may be the private sector that has seen this first. It was great talking to you, Peter. Thanks a lot for your insights.